All right, all right. Welcome back to chapter five. So today we are talking about the characteristic equation. So a couple of things to review before we get into this. Last time I, we talked about what the definition of an eigenvalue or an eigenvector was. Um, and if you need to go back and review that now, uh, feel free. But here are a couple of facts that we will need today. So how do we find the eigenvalues of a matrix? What that means is we're looking for some kind of value, a scalar here. So the eigenvalue is this scalar here. So if that when a vector is multiplied by a, it just scales the vector. It could be positive, it could be negative, it could be a fraction bigger, or, or it could be a whole number bigger. Um, but we are looking for the eigenvalue, which is lambda, a scalar. Ooh, wow, cannot spell today. Scalar. Okay. Um, then x is the corresponding eigenvector. And it's really important to know that this eigenvector is tied to this specific scalar. They are not, uh, you don't break them apart. This is not going to be an eigenvector for any other scalar. And we're going to talk about how to find all of the scalars, all of the eigenvalues today. So um, the re how we were going to find this was we were going to rearrange the equation to make it a homogeneous equation. And then we were going to factor, because um, really this is lambda times the identity matrix. So we were going to factor out the x. And we want to put the identity matrix there because it wouldn't make sense to do a matrix minus a scalar. Um, that's not mathematically possible. So we have to do a matrix minus a matrix. So really, this is lambda times the identity matrix, okay? Um, and then once we have subtracted these two, we are looking for the x's, the solutions. Those will be the eigenvectors that correspond to this eigenvalue that I've chosen right here, okay? Solutions will be eigenvectors, and we row reduce to find that solution. The, the idea, though, is we want to find these lambda values that give us a non-trivial solution. Again, the, the reason we want a non-trivial solution is getting the trivial solution here doesn't tell us anything about lambda. Putting a zero vector here is, of course, going to make everything equal to zero, because mathematically, you've known this for a while, anything times zero should be zero. Okay, I know we get into some weird things in calculus where we do like infinity times zero and that's weird, but here, if we're not taking limits, okay, we've got a finite number times, finite object times zero is going to equal zero. That's not interesting. That doesn't tell us anything about lambda. So I want a non-trivial solution, something I could put here that is not the zero vector. Okay, so again, these values of lambda that we're looking for are called characteristic values or eigenvalues, and if lambda is an eigenvalue of A, then the non-trivial solutions to this equation here are the eigenvectors. And again, last time we also talked about how to find the eigenspace, which meant it was the span of the eigenvectors, specific to, again, specific to one eigenvalue. So today we're going to go further, as promised, and figure out how to find all the eigenvalues. Last time in 5.1, I gave you an eigenvalue. Um, or I gave you a specific eigenvector and then made you test whether it was an eigenvalue or eigenvector or test what the corresponding eigenvalue was or test what the corresponding eigenvector was. Here we're going to start from scratch. Okay, so da -da -da -da, the invertible matrix theorem. You can review this from 2.5 and also I think the, the other section is 4.6. I don't know why I didn't type that in there, but those are the two sections where we've got the invertible matrix theorem. Remember, a couple things. Everything that we're doing in this chapter is going to have to do with square matrices, okay? So n by n matrices. The following statements are equivalent. So they're all true or they're all false, okay? And look how many we have, a through r. And I bet if you went through them and kind of looked at your previous note cards or your notes, you might be able to even add a couple in here. Um, and I want to think about one in particular, because these are all times um, when a uh, matrix is invertible, um, I've got a pivot in every column, I've got a pivot in every row, all that jazz, um, which is covered here in C for n pivot positions. But 
There is one more thing that is not in here that we want to add because it's going to be the basis for what, we're, and I don't mean mathematical basis, but it is going to be the foundation of what we are going to do today in order to be able to find the eigenvalues from scratch. Okay, and that is, okay, if a matrix is invertible, you know that the determinant of A is not zero. A lot of you have used that on a quiz or a test to kind of prove that a matrix is invertible. Okay, so if the determinant is equal to zero, oh, and I need to have better notation. So if the determinant of a matrix is equal to zero, then it is not invertible. All these statements are false. Which means, and this is what we want, um, there is, ooh, there is a non-trivial solution to AX equals zero. That is related to what we wanted up here. We wanted to find non-trivial solutions to this matrix equation. So if I can prove that a minus lambda i has a determinant of zero, then I can prove that I will get non-trivial solutions. And that's how we're gonna, we're gonna force that to be true in order to find the eigenvalues. Okay, so conclusion. If we want a minus lambda i times x equals zero to have non-trivial solutions. So if we want that to happen, then the determinant of a minus lambda i should be equal to zero. Okay, and we're on the next page gonna look at if this has to be true in order for us to get non-trivial solutions, AKA in order for us to be able to find out the eigenvectors, then what does this mathematically imply? So that's where we're going next. Okay, but again, this is all coming from our invertible matrix theorem. The idea that the determinant is equal to zero means this is non-invertible, aka free variables. Okay, so this is going to give us an equation. The determinant of a minus lambda i equal to zero is going to be the characteristic equation. Okay, the characteristic, notice difference, characteristic polynomial is just the determinant expression. Setting it equal to zero is the characteristic equation. Okay, just a little distinction. So, how could we do this? Let me auto focus a little bit. Did that make it better? No, it made it worse. One more time. Wow. Hold on, friends. So um, the first thing we need to do, okay, we're trying to find the eigenvalues. And I think in the field notes, I've taken it a little bit further and found the eigenvectors too. Um, we're just going to stop at the eigenvalues for the video, but I'll do the eigenvectors in the next problem. So if I'm trying to find the eigenvalues, I haven't been given any. So that means if there are going to be eigenvalues, a, the determinant of a minus lambda i should be equal to zero. All right. So first thing you need to do is make a minus lambda i. So a minus lambda i is going to be, okay, and remember I just subtract one from all the, or lambda, excuse me, lambda from the diagonals. So here I have zero minus lambda, and then five minus lambda. Okay, so that is my matrix. The determinant of that matrix, and this is two by two, so we can do it the normal way is, in my normal way, I mean just a little bit of cross-section. Um, maybe later we're going to want to do some kind of cofactor expansion to make larger matrices uh, easier to take the determinant of. But here I've got negative lambda times 5 minus lambda minus 1 times negative 6. So maybe I'll distribute. I've got negative, let me put 5 first, 5 lambda plus lambda squared plus six. Okay, well that 
looks like some Algebra 2 with some weirdo symbols. Okay, hopefully you've got your factoring brain turned back on. Because I want this to be equal to 0. Okay, in order for there to be, again, determinant equals 0 implies free variables. Free variables implies that we will get non-trivial solutions to uh, ax, oh well, a minus lambda i x equals 0. And that's what we want. So this is going to happen, okay, when lambda equals 2 and lambda equals 3, okay? And I know I did the right number because this is a 2 by 2 matrix, so there could only be up to n distinct eigenvalues. I couldn't have like three eigenvalues if I only had two columns or two rows. Okay, so make sure that you're not getting any more than the number of columns or rows. Okay, so I've got lambda equals two, lambda equals three. Um, you could take each of these separately and plug them back into the a minus lambda i equation, then row reduce that matrix to find a description of all the eigenvectors associated with that specific eigenvalue, which I'll show you in a second. I just wanna do it with something a little bit more complex. Okay, here, um, we're gonna do this with a cofactor expansion because nobody likes to take derivatives um, and do any more work than we have to. So again, I'm gonna write first a minus lambda i. So in this case, that is going to be one minus lambda, zero, one, then two minus five minus lambda, eight, and one, zero, one minus lambda. Okay, so we're gonna have to do some creative factoring here. Okay, but first I'm gonna take the determinant of a minus lambda i, and that is going to be, okay, starting at zero, okay? Remember that if I start at zero, okay, I'm gonna, sorry, let me go back. I'm gonna do the cofactor expansion across row number two because um, it has a bunch of zeros in it. So that means the first one would be zero because I would start with here. The next one I'm gonna have is, okay, and don't forget, um, I have to do negative one to the two plus two, that's four. Okay, so I'll write that anyway. Okay, so plus negative one to the two plus two times negative five minus lambda times the determinant if I eliminate this row and this column. So one minus lambda, one, one, one minus lambda. Okay, and then again, the last one would be zero. Don't forget about your negatives. I almost did, that's why I had to pause and think again. Okay, so here, this is gonna be one, so I'm gonna just leave it alone. Negative five minus lambda, and I have to take this little mini determinant. So that means I'm gonna have one minus lambda times one minus lambda minus one. Okay, now here comes the fun part. Remember, I want this determinant to be set equal, woo, set equal to zero, okay? So I need to factor this. Maybe it's not obvious right away, but I don't want to expand this. That's going to be a lot of work, and then I'm going to end up having to move it back out again. This is already in partially factored form, so I know that one of my lambdas is right here, but I also need to set this equal to zero. And you could do that two ways. You can either factor it, as I'm about to do, or you could set it equal to zero by itself, and then as you're taking the square root of both sides, make sure you do a plus or minus. But here, let me just show you some creative factoring because this is still the difference of squares. So this is going to be one minus lambda plus one times one minus lambda minus one. Okay, and now I have three separate factors for my three eigenvalues. And I am going to get lambda equals negative five. Okay, these get added together, so lambda equals two and then these get subtracted, so lambda equals zero. Remember that it's okay for um, lambda to equal zero. It is not okay for us to get zero as an eigenvector, but it's okay for us to get an eigenvalue as zero. What that indicates to me here is that two of my columns were linearly dependent already, which means I would have gotten free variables if I had just reduced a by itself. And that's obvious when you take a look at column one and column three, you can see that column one and column three are linearly dependent, so therefore I will get an eigenvalue of zero. 
There's a cool check. Okay. All right. But let's go ahead. I'm going to keep going and I'm going to find the um, a description of the eigenvectors associated with each distinct eigenvalue. So I'm going to start up here with lambda equals negative 5. So if lambda equals negative 5, I'm going to take negative 5 and plug it in here. Okay, so that means I get 6, and then this doesn't change. 2, I get 0, because that was where, that's where my free variable ends up being. No pivot there. And then again, 1, 0, 6. When I row reduce this, and I did that in my calculator, but I am getting 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and then I'm getting some weirdo fractions. So if you need to pause and change it into fraction form, that's fine, but I get negative 2 over 23, and I get 35 over 46, and 0. Okay, so that means uh, my solutions are all going to be uh, dependent on my free variable, which is x3. So my solutions will be in vector form. Okay, My eigenvectors will all be scalar multiples of the vector 2 divided by 2 thirds, negative 35 over 46, and 1. Okay, Remember this is me um, adding all of these constants to the other side of the equation. Remember, because it says x1 minus 2 over 23 x3 equals 0. That's the top equation. This is x2 plus 35 over 46 x3 equals 0. And then we want x3 to be itself here. So all vectors in the eigenspace uh, 4 are associated with lambda equals negative 5 uh, all of those vectors are scalar multiples of this vector right here. So I'll do one more. Let's do lambda equals 2. So if lambda equals 2, I should get a totally distinct eigenspace. Okay, and a fun fact was that the eigenspace I will get, okay, the described by um, an associated eigenvector, it will be linearly independent from this vector. So the eigenspaces are actually not related. So here, if I get my matrix A minus lambda i, and I plug in 2, I am getting negative 1, 0, 1, 2, negative 7, 8, 1, 0, negative 1. Okay, I row reduce, let me give myself a little more room. Draw a little line here so you're not confused. Row reduced. Okay, I am getting 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, negative 1, 0, 0. Ah, this is going to be a much nicer one. Okay, so again though, x3 is still my free variable. x is going to be all vectors in the eigenspace associated with lambda equals 2 are going to be scalar multiples of the vector. 1, 0, because this is x2 equals 0, 1. Okay, there it is. Okay, and notice again that this vector and this vector are linearly independent. That was the theorem from the end of 5.1. And we would also want to find um, the, oh, sorry, one more thing. Also, if I was asked to find a basis for the eigenspace associated with lambda equals negative 5, that would just be this vector. Okay, and if I was asked to find the basis of the eigenspace associated with this eigenvalue, the lambda equals 2, that would just be this vector. Okay, because remember a basis is the basic building blocks you need to span the whole space you're looking for, and that would be given here in our solutions. You would also find a um, eigenspace associated with lambda equals 0. I'm just skipping over that for the sake of time. Okay, um, I am going to leave example number three for a little bit more practice. Um, so if you want to pause here and check yourself with the filled notes, that's great. Um, the factoring is a little weird on this one. Uh, so I would actually try, try to factor it on your own first. Um, but I want to go down here to uh, the invertible matrix theorem. So we're adding on, now we're at T. We're going from A all the way to T. So the invertible matrix theorem implies a lot of things. Okay. 
a is invertible if and only if the number zero is not an eigenvalue of a. Remember, and that's what I was saying on the other page, if zero is an eigenvalue of a, that meant that two of the columns were linearly independent already. Okay, it means we didn't need to take anything away to cause there to be um, non-trivial solutions to ax equals zero. So the number zero is not an eigenvalue of a, okay, and also, again, the chart of a is not zero. Okay, um, so here, okay, again, this, find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, this is an upper triangular matrix. So we're viewed from last time, okay, since, since a is triangular, and you can check this with a cofactor expansion, but your, uh, your eigenvalues are on the diagonal. So lambda equals three, lambda equals six, lambda equals two are eigenvalues of A. And again, uh, what you would do to find the eigenvectors associated with each of these eigenvalues, you would make an equation, A minus lambda I, where you plugged in each of these separately, not all at the same time, separately, lambda equals three, lambda equals six, lambda equals two, um, row reduce, and uh, then find the parametric vector solutions to AX equals zero. Okay, all right. Very short, next couple things, and then I wanna do two proofs before we end. So the algebraic multiplicity, because it is possible for there to be uh, um, a eigenvalue repeated twice, or more than that. Um, so the algebraic multiplicity of eigenvalue is the same as its multiplicity of the characteristic equation. So here, since this is a lower triangular matrix, um, my characteristic polynomial would be lambda minus two, and I don't really care about the signs because they all end up, oh, maybe I do care about the signs, okay. All right, because it's supposed to be lambda, or excuse me, a minus lambda i, a minus lambda i, so I wanna do it in the right order. So two minus lambda, three minus lambda, three minus lambda, and negative one minus lambda. Okay. All right. So my character, my, uh, and I'm, I know that this is my characteristic polynomial because this is a lower triangular matrix. So my eigenvalues would be lambda equals two, lambda equals three with a multiplicity of two and lambda equals negative one. Okay. Um, I want you to pause and try out what it means to have a multiplicity of two. Um, in regards to the eigenspace. So if it counts twice, what does that mean for the eigenspace? Okay, so try that out on your own time. Okay, but one more definition for today is similarity. Okay, and we want two matrices, both square. A and B are similar if we can find an invertible matrix P such that P inverse AP equals B. So doing something to A would be give you b, or equivalently, if I multiply them both to the other side, uh, p, b, p inverse equals a. Okay, key though. Similarity is not the same as row equivalence. Remember that row equivalence means um, you can do row operations only to a matrix and change it into the other matrix. So if a and b were row equivalent, all I would have to do is do a couple row operations to get to b. This is totally different. We are actually multiplying A by a matrix and its inverse on other sides. Now, some of us, I think, might think that you're like, wait a second, P, A, or P inverse AP, doesn't that equal the identity matrix? Because P inverse times P is the, or doesn't this just equal A, excuse me, because P inverse times P is the identity matrix? Nope. Okay, this is why order of operations matters. Matrix multiplication is not commutative. This, you would either multiply A times P first, or you would multiply P inverse times A first. Um, it is associative, so you have choices whether you wanna do this one or you wanna do this one, but you cannot rearrange the order of this multiplication, which is why this is going to be equal to a very different matrix, okay? Um, this is important in the context of our notes today because if the two matrices are similar, then they have the same characteristic polynomial and therefore the same eigenvalues. So proof. So notice that it started with if these two square matrices are similar. 
So we are given that A and B are similar. Okay, and I'm trying to get somewhere to show that they have the same characteristic polynomial. But we're going to start with what it means to be similar. So that means I'm going to say B equals P inverse AP. Okay, that's the definition of similarity. Okay, but to find eigenvalues, I need to uh, make a characteristic polynomial, which means I need to do B minus lambda I. And whatever I do to the left side, I have to do to the right side. Okay. All right. Now, one thing that we were kind of referencing up here, but I don't really know if I want this I to be here um, when I've got everything else in terms of P and P inverse. So I'm going to write this as P inverse P. Instead of the identity matrix, I'm going to change it to P inverse P. And I'm going to be strategic about that order because that is the same order as this one. So again, matrix multiplication is not commutative, but it is associative and it is distributive. So that means if P inverse, and lambda is a scalar, so we're allowed to do this, P inverse is being multiplied on the left side of both this term and this term, I can factor it out to the left. So this is the same as P inverse times AP minus lambda P. And the second step I can do is since P is being multiplied on the right side of both of these terms, I can factor it out to the right. So this will be P inverse A minus lambda I, because we can't have A minus lambda. A minus a constant doesn't make sense because it's a matrix minus a constant. Okay, P. Okay, notice I haven't changed the left side at all. So now, Okay, all I need to do is take the determinant. Determinant of B minus lambda I equals the determinant, oh, that says dead. I am dead. The determinant of P inverse A minus lambda I times P. Okay, and here's where we get stuck. How do we know what this is equal to? So we want to pause real quick. I want to go to the next proof. Okay, and maybe I should have reordered this. I get it, but bear with me. Okay. Important thing is if A and B are similar, then their determinants are equal. So we're going to try this again. And we're going to use this back on our last step. So given A and B are similar, that means, again, B equals P inverse AP. Okay, and then I want the determinants. So determinant of B is equal to the determinant of P inverse AP. Now, one nice thing about determinants is you can't do this if things are being added, but I can do this if things are being multiplied. So the determinant of P inverse AP, okay, should be the same as the determinant of P inverse times the determinant of A times the determinant of P. Okay, and now I can rearrange this to my advantage because these are all constants being multiplied together. So this is also equal to the determinant of P inverse times the determinant of P times the determinant of A. Okay, again, because they're all constants. Now I can put it back together. This is the determinant of P inverse P times the determinant of A. But P inverse P is the identity. And the determinant of the identity is 1. So we have concluded that given A and B are similar, the determinant of B equals the determinant of A. That will only work if they are similar. Okay, because remember, if you were doing row operations, um, that's where you could get messed up. Your determinant might change if you switch rows or you factor something out. Okay, so row equivalent matrices don't necessarily have the same determinant, but similar matrices do have the same determinant. So let's take this. Okay, well, this process that we just did here, and let's go back to our previous proof. 
this, okay, I could split this determinant up into determinant of P inverse, determinant of A minus lambda I, determinant of P, rearrange it, put together P and P inverse, get the identity, and really this will be equal to the determinant of A minus lambda I. And this will mean that they are given the, we have the same characteristic polynomial, okay? Therefore, um, A and B have the same characteristic polynomial. Therefore, A and B have the same eigenvalues. QED. Okay. So that's our notes for today. Um, recap real quick. We'll go back to the beginning here. What we did today is we looked at something called the characteristic equation. In 5.1, we defined what an eigenvalue is and what the I associated eigenvector is. And if I'm given an eigenvalue, how to find the eigenspace. But we asked today, how, what if I don't know any of the eigenvalues? How can I figure them out? We looked at our invertible matrix theorem and we said, okay, what we want is this equation to have non-trivial solutions. How do I get a non-trivial solution? You get a non-trivial solution if A is not invertible, because these are all equivalent. For A to not be invertible, that means that I can't have a pivot in every column, whatever, blah, blah, blah. But really, it means that I need the determinant of that matrix I'm looking for to be equal to zero. So we, in order to find the eigenvalues, what we did was we created the matrix A minus lambda I without plugging in any specific lambdas. Okay, so we did, let me show you over here. We created a minus lambda i without plugging in a specific lambda. We took the determinant of that matrix and said, in order for this, this matrix to have non-trivial solutions to a minus lambda i x equals zero, this determinant that we just found out must be equal to zero. And then we were able to factor, use a little algebra two to find our eigenvalues. After we did that, we could go back and find our eigenvectors associated with that specific eigenvalue, aka finding the basis for the eigenspace associated with this eigenvalue. Okay. Hopefully you have a great day and a great weekend, and remember to come into Office Hours if you have questions.